Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar series. If you have any questions during the presentations, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of each presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Manitoba Agriculture YouTube channel shortly after broadcast, and you will receive a link to that recording. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. I'd like to welcome everybody to Crop Talk for September the 18th and uh, had a shower of rain go through uh, late last night and early this morning and uh, so uh, probably going to pull a few people out of the field and uh, probably make a lot of the elevators fairly busy this morning. So uh, I uh, thought today we could have an opportunity to uh, uh, talk to uh, Dane Frace. Uh, there's been uh, some updates with uh, Club Root in Manitoba here, and uh, I thought it'd be interesting to go over some of those updates, some of the new uh, new finds, as I guess it is, in, in the area, and see what uh, what's kind of up in the future for us for Club Root here. After that, uh, I was going to do a bit of a crop update on how the crop has been handling the wet conditions and where we're kind of sitting as harvest wise throughout uh, throughout the province and and in the southwest here so um, i guess with that we'll uh, hand it over to uh to dane to uh, get started on a club root update all right thank you so much lionel uh can everyone see my screen right now you bet perfect okay then i'll i'll keep moving so uh quick update on Club Root, uh, this, this past year in Manitoba, you've, you've probably heard uh, a fair bit in the farm media the last year, particularly from January till April of, of 2019, where Club Root was a main focus and extension message for Manitoba agriculture. What we'd like to do is just follow up on that and say where we've where things have changed in 2019. And I'll go through just what Club Root is very briefly for those of you who might not be familiar, and then how to manage it uh, towards the end. So starting off, club root is a soil-borne disease caused by Plasmodiophora brassicae. So it's a long-lived obligate pathogen. Now that's just a fancy way of explaining or saying that club root needs a living host in order to complete its life cycle. If it doesn't have a living susceptible host, it's not able to replicate itself and keep on producing more and more spores that could infect. Yield losses from club root occur by galls forming on plant roots. Uh, restricting and preventing uptake of water nutrients. It basically just starves a plant uh, to death, and, and in that starvation process, it, it just limits the seed production that that you normal know, plant could, could do. Now, uh, starts off, its life cycle starts off as the resting spore on the left-hand side of your screen here, that thick-walled, single-celled resting spore. Under the right conditions, um, adequate temperature and moisture, those spores germinate, releasing zoospores. They are mobile in soil water solution or soil moisture, and they can swim a little bit to try and find a susceptible host. Right here is our canola plant, susceptible host. It's going to infect the root hairs first. Those are the smallest um, single-celled root tissues. It's going to try and get there first, easiest to get in. It's going to, once it corrupts those root cells, um, that infection just spreads and just moves from cell to cell to cell. It corrupts those cells, not allowing them to function normally, and just uses them as creates its own little factory inside those cells, replicating and producing more and more spores or club root. As those spores or those clubbed roots degrade at the end of the season, in usually September, October, um, they break down and it's a peat moss type structure, and that releases spores back into the soil for another year's infection. And just what you're looking for here, we've got a whole gall on the left, so it's not begun to break down. These are infected clubbed root tissues here, so you see how swollen they are, versus on the right-hand side, we have a gall that's beginning to decay. So those that plant is either dead or dying, or the infection is to the point where um, it causes the, the plant to, to have died, or it's later on in the year, and those galls start to break down. So they burst open in a way, and those spores, um, that genetic material is just peat moss type structure that's inside that tends to slough off into the soil. Now when we're talking about club root, it's important to know how many spores per gram are in the soil because that does tend to uh, correlate the level of infection we see and the severity of the infection. Now these, um, this picture in front of you is, is from greenhouse studies. It's similar in field cases, but uh, not always the same because field conditions may vary. Um, we might have 
optimum conditions or, or, or more severe conditions for disease development, and it might take a greater number or smaller number of spores per gram of soil to cause comparable levels of infection. So generally, um, less than a thousand spores per gram of soil, we don't usually see any type of infection. There might be a little bit something here on, on this second plant. On the third plant, around 10,000 spores per gram of soil, we do see some gall start to develop here in, in the greenhouse, but that isn't a very severe infection. I would class that as less than 25% infection, possibly even less than 10%. Because we still have uh, so many healthy roots, that plant is still gonna be able to uptake water and nutrients, and we're not gonna notice above ground symptoms. As you cross over to 100,000 spores per gram of soil, um, the galls become more severe. And here we have a gall formed at the base of the main tap root. So as you can see how thick the tap root is here, a lot thinner down here, it's physically choking off the flow of nutrients on top of that plant. Yield loss will start to occur. And over here at a million spores per gram of soil, that root is basically fully compromised and um, that, that plant is, is gonna be certainly losing yield. It's, it's tough to pinpoint exactly how much, but it certainly will be losing yield potential. So last year's situation, we added um, a new RM or a new RM had symptoms observed. So Dufferin became the seventh RM with confirmed club root case in Manitoba. Uh, there was 18 new fields reported last year and one of those came from Dufferin. The other ones came from RMs where it was previously known to have been established. Now for this year, we've only had two new fields confirmed to date. That brings our total now to 35 fields over eight municipalities that have um, visual symptoms or root galls developing. There are more fields than that that do have test or have tested positive for genetic material in the soil, but we weren't able to find uh, galls developing on the roots. But we do know that 35 fields that have been reported to Manitoba Ag um, do have positive symptomology. Now. One of the reasons we're, we're finding it more frequently now in the past few years than we have in previous years is it's simply a higher awareness, um, lack of other diseases. It's been a couple dry years for the most part. Um, that allows club root affected areas to become easier to spot. It's not being masked by um, severe drought or, or severe uh, moisture stress. Um, black leg and sclerotinia might not be as predominant uh, in a drier year. Or particularly sclerotinia, uh, and then we still find an area that's looking suspicious, and then that causes the farmer or the agronomist to stop, uh, get out, and go take a look at that patch and, and find out what's happening there. And you can't find above ground symptoms, then looking below the ground and then finding something happening there. And then those cases end up being reported to Manitoba Bank, and we can include it in our provincial map. Now, you may have heard in farm media and, the, and in press releases lately that a new pathotype was discovered in the arm of Pemina. Uh, I will touch on that in a few more slides. So this is our latest map from 2019 as of yesterday. Uh, so we've added Bifrost Riverton. So the arm of Bifrost Riverton up near Arburg in the North Interlake has a confirmed positive field with uh, club root, with symptomology. We wanted to make sure this map is up to date and that farmers and agronomists are aware of where club root is spreading and is at a higher risk for development in the province. Well, certainly farms in those red municipalities or even the ones in the orange municipalities should, should certainly be more vigilant in looking at their canola crops um, and checking out those suspicious looking areas. Now there's a lot more canola grown um, in the parkland and north of the number one highway up, up in the northwest portion of Manitoba. Just because we're not finding um, positive samples of club root there might, doesn't mean that they don't exist. Um, it just is a larger area for us to cover and sometimes we don't, we don't get out there as often as we'd like. So it's certainly important to keep on uh, checking those canola crops too. Now, the new pathotype is called 3A. So it was first discovered in Alberta uh, and it was able to overcome first generation club root genetic resistance. Um, first gen resistance is generally a blanket type resistance. It's tested against pathotypes 2, 3, 5, 6, and 8. But you notice 2, 3, 5, 6, and 8 don't have a letter associated with them. That's because this is from the older Williams set developed back in 1966. Um, today in, in Western Canada, we use uh, the Canadian club root differential set combined with the Williams set. So it gets a number and a letter. 
And that uh, Canadian club root differential set was developed at the U of A by Dr. Stephen Strelko. So now the old pathotype three is now three H. So first gen resistance where it's, where it's labeled R on the bag to, to two, three, five, six, and eight is considered resistant to three H. However, we're finding three A, the letter is random. Um, it's a different form of the pathotype, meaning that that R rated line um, does not claim resistance against that pathotype. So if we grew a, a regular club root resistant variety on a field that had a pathotype or 3A present, it won't do anything uh, to prevent the infection and spread of that disease. So really what we're looking at here is a much smaller basket of resistant canola varieties that claim resistance to 3A, and they fall under the second gen um, pool of, of club root genetic resistance. So it's it's newer material, it's um, multiple genes, they're stacked genes, they're not as readily available commercially, so it's it's just going to take more consideration to manage um, club root populations if 3A has been detected on a particular farm. So you can take a look at that uh, hyperlink there, that does bring you to the press release from Manitoba Agriculture. Now, there are 17 known club root pathotypes in Canada, um, pathotypes three and five of the older William set are the most common. Pathotype 3A being a little bit different, again, does not work in that traditional first generation club root genetic resistance. Now, it doesn't mean that the genes become effective and the variety is no longer effective. That's not the case. It's just that the population of club root spores in the soil is different. And when we're talking about club root spore populations in the soil, there's usually more than one pathotype present. The most dominant one is usually the one that's picked up on the screen. So in this case, it was 3A, but there could be other ones present like pathotype two or pathotype eight that are just masked and, and kind of hiding in the background when, when one of them is the bulk of the population. So longer rotations and using appropriate club root resistant varieties continues to be a good strategy for that. So keeping the rotation as long as possible and, and rotating resistant varieties as well, not just using the same club root resistant variety over time because that acts as a selection pressure and your club root population may shift over time to, to accommodate or adjust for that specific pressure on it. Now, we wanna talk about risk reduction and how to reduce the risk of club root being found on our farms or, or reduce the risk of spreading. So number one is rotation. Uh, we start at the star and, and, and there's a reason for that. It's the single best tool we have to reduce the risk of club root developing and causing yield loss on our farms. So we wanna have a two to three year break between canola crops at a minimum. So that's a one in three or a one in four rotation. You've gotta have something different. So cereals, soybeans, corn, flax, you name it. Um, none of our commercial cro um, crops in Western Canada are susceptible to club root except for canola and mustard. So no. Second up, scouting, then controlling volunteers, testing soil, growing resistant varieties, reducing soil movement, practicing good field sanitation and record keeping. I'll touch on those in a little bit more detail. And the reason rotation is our main tool is because of the longevity of the club root pathogen in soil. Club root can su survive in the soil for between 10 to 20, 25 years in the absence of the canola crop. But once the pathogen is established there, it's you can't get rid of it. It just takes a change in management practice to deal with it successfully. Now, we want to reduce our spore load buildup so that we can take advantage of the half-life principle of, of club root, meaning that every four to six years, about half the existing spores in the soil become unviable. They don't, they're not able to infect. So the longer we can wait, the more spores will die off naturally and should be able to drop below a level where root infection or visual yield loss starts to occur. So the reason we, we want to emphasize rotation is that we're in a position in Manitoba where club root is not as widespread as it is in the other provinces um, and our levels are generally lower. So we want to keep them low because should they increase our rotation length has to increase accordingly. And just as a reminder down here on the bottom we know that wheat and canola is a profitable um, for our profitable crops to grow Growing them back to back is not a rotation. That's just an alternation and um, ends up becoming or, or increasing this, the risk of club root developing 
on your farmland. So when we're looking for uh, areas that could be affected, we'll talk about um, spots that are stressed or prematurely ripening compared to other spots in the same field. So we're looking at those oddly developing areas. Generally, they're smaller, they're stunted, and they're more mature or they're more advanced than the other crops just due to the stress applied to them. So checking field approaches, the corners of the fields, the low spots, the water runs, and near yards and shelter belts. So anywhere a machinery can move onto the field or drop soil or where wind and water can move soil within the landscape or trap moving, moving soil. And digging up, not just pulling plants from those areas to compare to healthy portions of the field. And um, clubber development is favored by moist, warm soils with lower pH. So if you've got a spot that's slightly more acidic in the field or, or lower pH in the rest of the field, that might be a spot to look at first too. Now this is a, a picture from a field taken just this year. There, this is a positive, a positively identified clubroot field. It's fairly evident that something is going on here given the range and maturity. This whole field was seeded the same day, was sprayed the same day, it's all been treated the same. Uh, however, you notice there are certainly brown patches in the field compared to the rest of it. Now, after walking out into the field, I found that clubroot uh, infection was most severe in this area. The galls were the largest, they were the most advanced. Uh, at this time when the field was swathed just the day before this picture was taken. So unfortunately I don't have a standing crop, but walking out to that area, that's where the galls were the most advanced, they were the largest. And because the crop was drying down and, and dying uh, effectively, those galls didn't have any food source because that plant tissue was now dead. So those galls started to degrade Quickest. So those were the ones that were the most peaty and the most degraded when I went to look at the field. I did find some galls from some of the other green areas, but they were generally smaller and they were still whole and intact. To me, meaning that uh, the infection wasn't as severe there or the plant was able to access other water and nutrients that it allowed it to survive longer and, and will likely produce more yield than the other area of the field. So certainly it looks different and, and um, quite visually obvious at this time. Now, these root galls came from that uh, same field, except for the, the one on the left. We've got different stages or levels of infection here. So in this particular was plant, this is very early gall. We've only got one small gall on one of the side lateral roots uh, of, the, of this canola plant. So it's a very small or limited infection, but this is where we want to catch, catch early, and then we're able to implement good management strategies moving forward. The center image here is a fairly well-developed gall and there's quite a large tumor almost at, at the base of that main tap root so it is choking off that plant from receiving water and nutrients and it, and it is suffering yield wise yield losses can range between five and 100 percent on plants like this and now here um, the galls were the most developed if i dug up the soil surrounding this root tissue i found remnants of that gall and that peat type structure in the soil but after I pulled it up, what I do is because that tissue has started to degrade, I just rip off the lateral and tap roots. I'm not able to see what the level of, of gall development was. So if you're just pulling up plants, you might lose some of those roots. That's why it is suggested to dig them up too in suspicious areas. So you're able to get a better picture of what it looked like overall. Now, canola is not the only host, but it's, and canola and mustard are the main commercial crops, but there are alternate hosts too. And we want to prevent having susceptible hosts there in non-canola years, as well as canola years, just to prevent having um, a green bridge to allow that disease to infect. I mentioned it needs a living host in order to complete its life cycle. If you deprive it of that host, um, those galls begin to degrade naturally and the, the, the spore level doesn't increase in the soil. So things like wild mustard, stinkweed, shepherd's purse, flixweed, um, Volunteer canola obviously are hosts for, for uh, club root. I have perennial ryegrass down here because there are some studies that are ongoing looking at perennial ryegrass as a bait crop, um, considering it might allow club root to infect, but it doesn't seem to allow it to complete its life cycle and it, and it doesn't seem to harm yield for, for that particular crop. So uh, that's a kind of a to be determined uh, crop there. Just some of the, the um, spring annuals you want to look for and, and control early on uh, before, before the six weeks after, after seeding so that they aren't allowed to be reinfected from club root spores that, that happen in the field. 
club root infection generally occurs late June, early July. So stinkweed, shepherd's purse, and flicksweed on, on that shot there. Now, next up is testing. We want to see where club root is spreading within the province, and we want to be proactive about it. So testing is ongoing. Producers submit samples independently, or, or they can be submitted through Manitoba Agriculture as well. Uh, the Manitoba Canola Growers Association funds the Pest Surveillance Initiative Lab in Winnipeg through grower checkoff dollars. And that lab is, is looking at a, a couple of different things. glyphosate resistant kochia, black leg race testing, and club root uh, soil detection. So you can send in a soil sample. Um, so you're looking at taking a sample right off the surface uh, of the soil, not a core down to 36 inches, just, just a cupful off the surface, sending that into the lab and figuring out how many spores per gram of soil are present. If you suspect a patch or you're near a, a hot club root hot zone and you want to just see where things are at in your field. They'll send you a report that looks like this, gives you an indication of where your spore load is uh, per gram of soil in, in that sample. It allows you for a little bit more targeted action. This, this particular result came back at 3,328 spores per gram of soil. So it's on the lower end of the spectrum. I wouldn't generally be seeing visual root infection at this time, um, but finding it early at this low level indicates to me that um, we've got to put, implement a longer rotation. We have to start proactively using quadrant resistant varieties. And we need to do a better job of uh, equipment sanitation so we prevent the spread. Or perhaps it's just a small patch. We can isolate that patch, uh, seed it down to a forage grass or something, and just take it out of production, to prevent the spread mixing through the field. Now, I talked about resistant varieties a fair bit. Last year was the first year we included a resistant hybrid listing in the Manitoba Seed Guide or Seed Manitoba. We're, we've updated it for 2020. So there are a total of 37. Um, club root resistant lines that are currently commercially available in Manitoba. Uh, there might be more, there's always a few more that creep in through the winter that don't make it into the guide, but 11 of them are Liberty tolerant lines, two are Clearfield lines, the rest being uh, Roundup Ready or, or TrueFlex lines. Uh, first generation genetic resistance is what occurs in most of them. So that first gen resistance is a blanket resistance against pathotypes two, three, five, six, and eight but without the letter qualification. You'll notice there's a couple on here that claim specific resistance to some of the newer pathotypes, 2B, 3A, 5X, for example. Um, this means that it contains second generation uh, genetic resistance. So it, it's that, that is going to be a key source in managing um, club root pathogens that are novel to the province, like 3A that we found most recently. So look for uh, this listing in Seed Manitoba when it comes up with a cooperator last week of November. Now, there is the question that often comes up is the preemptive use of resistant varieties. Should I be using a club root resistant variety if I don't have club root on my farm or if I'm in a lower risk area? Well, um, the thought originally was don't use it until absolutely necessary to preserve it, but that is not the messaging um, the, the provincial governments are going with, as well as the Canola Council, Manitoba Canola Growers. That's not the way to do it. Really, we want to see, see preemptive use if your individual and regional risk factors are higher, or even if, if they're not. Um, by using a club root resistant variety, that selection pressure only starts working if, in fact, that there's club root in that field. If there's no club root present in that field, um, that genetic potential in that crop isn't going to be used. It's not acting as a selection pressure. Um, there's no reason it won't continue to work in the long term. So using it proactively is a great way to keep on reducing the chance of spore load buildup. And if you're a farm in those one of those red RMs, um, you don't think you have club root on your on your field, I would certainly advise using club root resistant varieties proactively rather than waiting until you find club root there and, and then having to have a limited series of options when it comes to managing it long term. So the aim is to prevent the amplification of your soil spores and you must have responsible management for overcoming resistance. So you can't just use that same resistant variety over and over. You do need to rotate sources of resistance as well. Just like rotating uh, chemistries when managing uh, a tough weed in, in, a, in a crop, for example. Now, reducing soil movement is the other thing. Erosion and tillage uh, do move club root spores that are attached to soil particles. The wind, water, and tillage are our three main um, methods of soil movement. 
the fine and dry soil particles left unprotected on a soybean stubble, for example, that can easily be picked up and moved off site by those spring winds. Not a great practice. If we can try and keep residue on the surface and keep our soil in place, we reduce the risk of moving soil and spores around. Water overland movement, uh, same thing. Uh, and tillage. So high speed tillage is a great practice for sizing residue and prepping seed beds, but it also transfers soil the furthest distance. It doesn't move a lot of soil, but it moves a smaller amount of soil a greater distance than you would, uh, say, using a thistle plow or a moldboard plow on the other end of the spectrum. So um, if you have a patch that you're concerned about, perhaps reducing tillage through that area and avoiding it and, and seeding it down to something permanent so you're not mixing that infected soil in with the rest of the field to try and reduce the spread of a patch. And then sanitation and biosecurity. So we want to know who comes in and out of our fields. Uh, if you have farm tours or things like that, require the booties or cleaning your footwear with bleach or spray nine to disinfect. Uh, creating separate field entrances and exits. This is generally done if you have a fairly severe infection and it's limited to a portion of the field. You come in through that area, but you, 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 your machine goes through a clean portion of soil or a less infected area before pulling off the exit on the other side of the field. So you're reducing the spread from field to field. But then staging field operations to reduce soil transfer might be most applicable. So if you have one infected quarter out of 16, for example, seeding that field last, spraying it last, harvesting it last, working it last in fall, and working it when it's a little drier to prevent clods from sticking on the equipment. That way, hopefully, at the end of that operation, that set of operations, you have the time to stop that machine, pull onto a grass area or somewhere where traffic isn't, or real traffic isn't as high, knock all the loose dirt off, blow it off, wash it down, or bleach it off, and, and um, clean up that equipment before moving onto another area. And, and, reduce spreading infection. Now on my farm plan, this is what I've done to reduce the risk of club root. I, I don't, I'm not in one of those red RMs, but I want to reduce the risk obviously ahead of time. So I'm reducing tillage wherever possible. We do not cultivate after soybeans. We, we uh, just leave it as it is. We're looking at seeding a cover crop actually this year. We won't land roll because it simply pulverizes that top inch, inch and a half of soil, makes it into a fine powder dust and blows it off site when we have those windy springs. We have a minimum four year rotation, so there's at least a three year gap between canola crops. Anybody accessing our farmland has to have the club root plan in place or at least recognize the risk that club root poses and, and we'll be doing something about it. Uh, if, if they're in denial that, that club root can be a problem on, a, on, on farms, um, they're not coming onto my farmland, simple as that. We will begin testing in 2019, taking advantage of uh, the PSI labs testing program and we want to sanitize our equipment and footwear between visiting other farms. So we've tested our farmland, we know that we have very low risk or, or a low spore load if at all right now, um, so I don't need to sanitize between fields but I do try and knock off as much loose dirt as possible between fields just as a getting myself into the habit of doing so and then writing it down because it's not just myself, it's, um, a couple other family members and, and hired staff on the farm we just have it written down so we all know what to do. And so far, action taken by Manitoba Ag is communication with growers, doing webinars like this. Uh, we release our management recommendations that we've just talked about, and we continue testing affected and neighboring fields, either through individual reporting to Manitoba Ag. If an agronomist or a grower has a concern, you're welcome to get in touch with us. We keep that information fully confidential, um, but we do share which RM it's in so that we are able to keep the map up to date, up to date and other folks know where the risk is spreading. And, and then through our canola disease survey annually, if you've given us permission to go and look in your field, we'll take a look, see if we can find anything, and hopefully no news is good news. Now, Manitoba's response to date is that club root is not listed as a regulated pest, so that means no penalty can be imposed through municipal bylaws. That's different than Saskatchewan and Alberta. Um, there is no penalty for reporting this disease to Manitoba agriculture. There's nothing we can do about it as a result. We just want to make sure that you have the resources necessary to tackle and manage this disease um, and, and we want to reduce the stigma around it. So no penalty for reporting it. We're just relying on education and training to make sure people are able to stay on top of it. Now individual growers or affected growers receive technical support one-on-one -on -one from Manitoba agriculture staff. We don't share that sort of information but uh, you're welcome to get in touch with us and we'll happily help you set up a management plan for your farm. No, no problem.
And then anybody who participates in our survey, their just information is kept confidential. We don't share that. Now, when it comes to Clubroot, it's okay if you can't do everything on my list of eight points to manage Clubroot, but it's not okay if you do nothing. Um, starting now and recognizing the risk Clubroot poses is the most the, the, the best chance we have of us staying on top of this disease. We've had 10 years to learn from what's happening further west. If we're able to stay on top of, of Club Root, we are in a great position overall as a province. So being proactive about managing it is, is one of our best tools. And if you have any questions, I'll happily take them now. Feel free to get in touch with me, find me on Twitter, uh, or any of the other Manitoba Ag staff around, uh, throughout the province in our regional offices. Okay, thanks, Dane. Um, I've gotten a couple questions here. Um, for sure. Are, are uh, all the symptoms uh, the same for each pathotype? Yes, symptoms are the same. Um, certain pathotypes might be more aggressive than others. Um, but that generally happens only when you see a pathotype shift, for example. Uh, we haven't seen a pathotype shift in Manitoba. Um, the, when we found pathotype 3A, that was the first occurrence of, of us finding it, and there was no club root resistant variety that had been grown on that field prior that caused the pathotype to change from, say, something else moving into a 3A. So the symptomology, um, the level of disease, level of infection is generally all the same. We don't see any difference in the pathotype. The only way we can detect pathotype is when we find whole galls, we send them over to the University of Alberta, and they're able to figure out exactly which one it is based on that differential set. So they're the only one we use right now to figure out what type there is. Okay, and another one here. Um, you, you showed that picture of the field of the swath canola. So swathing, when you're swathing those dark to, to black areas in the field, would those be kind of your prime areas to be looking at? Those areas that are more advanced and more mature um, they're obviously browner at, at that swath timing than the rest of the crop, which could be a little bit greener. That might be a good indication or a good time for you to stop the swather or stop the sprayer if you're desiccating or, or doing a pre-harvest treatment. Get out and take a look at what's happening within that patch and then walk away to a healthy portion of the field and see what's happening there. So it's not just above ground symptoms. Um, you can't really tell it's club root just from the above ground other than the fact that the plant might be shorter or more mature or browner or stunted but we're really looking at what's happening below ground. So if you can rule out, rule out all above ground symptoms, looking at the roots is your key, key determining factor there. Okay, and this will be a tougher one. Um, have rotations been successful in Alberta? I'm a weed canola rotator. <laughs> uh, well, from what my understanding is of, of the Alberta rotation, where club root is, is most severe, is that the rotation is not great. Um, club root was first detected in Leduc County, south of Edmonton in 2003 in canola crops. So it's been um, almost two decades now that, that they've been dealing with that disease. The first number of years were more difficult. People were in shock and, and rotations did lengthen for a short amount of time. But crop rotation options in, in northern parts of the prairies are a little more limited. I mean, they're not be able to grow corn, they're not able to grow sunflowers or those, some of those longer season crops. In Manitoba, we do have the advantage of having generally more rotational crops at our disposal. So we don't have as great an excuse for not using a longer rotation. Um, but in the Alberta case, what, what often happened was as soon as club root resistant varieties came out, um, Farmers started using those varieties and then went back to the same rotation that they had before, canola, wheat, canola, or canola, canola, wheat, something like that. And they ended up overusing those resistant lines. And currently there's well over a hundred cases in, in uh, North Central Alberta where um, the club root resistance is no longer working or, or that the, the pathogen is shifted and is able to overcome that resistance. So now they're relying on the second gen resistance in order to, to manage it. Um, so rotation didn't work there because they didn't use it properly. Rotation has to be implemented and has to be implemented fairly strictly. Just because we have a resistant variety doesn't mean we can go back to a bad rotation practice. It needs to be used in combination. And, and where it's been used in combination, 
there it's shown to be successful and it's and and those first gen resistant genetics are still generally holding up well hope that answers that question it's kind of long-winded yeah that was kind of what i was thinking myself thinking that if we're because we have club root uh, ones uh, varieties that are resistant to everything say but the 3a type but mm -hmm. we continually them just because we think we were using resistance and we still only have a two-year rotation for you basically doing the same thing as herbicide resistant for selecting for for one for yep. one type and you give it a chance to build up faster that way right that's that's exactly right well picture a soybean field for example you've you've got um, a suspected roundup resistant kosher patch in a corner you spray it with roundup year one most of it dies but some doesn't and two years later you're growing soybeans again um, spraying Roundup again without tank mixing something else in, that Roundup resistant kosher patch is now, you know, three, four or five times as large and it's going to take a lot more to manage it. So just doing the same thing over and over again isn't really helping. You need to have more rotational crops in there that you're able to use different chemistries, different modes of action on that weed, say in your cereals or your canola, for example, to knock it back to the point where Roundup is still, or glyphosate is still an effective tool together with something else in the tank. Great. Well, that's uh, got all my questions answered here too, uh, Dane. So uh, thanks again for coming on today and giving us that update and uh, and giving us some more information on uh, on trying to handle this uh, this uh, this disease so we can uh, keep ahead of it. Not a problem. Thanks, Lionel. Thanks, everyone. Okay. So with that, we'll continue on with. Uh, an update of uh, what's been happening in the field and what's been going on in the past, uh, I guess, two weeks here. And uh, as usual, just to uh, to show where we are in the general scheme as to uh, moisture, corn heat units, uh, growing degree days. Um, again, we're uh, slowly climbing the uh, the ladder to growing degree days and starting to bring in some of those crops. And I'll show you some crops a little bit later here that. Um, are starting to progress uh, as we get closer to uh, percent of normal for our growing degree days and our corn heat units. Uh, when we look at our moisture overall, I guess uh, the general area, we're getting to that normal normal range and that's probably mainly due to the rain we've received over the past you know, week to 10 days here. Uh, still a couple pockets that are dry and it's kind of that uh, Nipua, kind of Nipua North area where they still been missing some of those uh, some of those rains, but uh, I guess for this time of year, uh, probably best to get harvest off and then for the rains to come after. Uh, this gives us our uh, I guess uh, where we are sitting at as uh, harvest as uh, a province right now, and compared that to our uh, three-year uh, average, and when you look at uh, a lot of the numbers we are uh, are below, um, and it's probably regions that are below, and not province in general. I think when you uh, you look at 71% of the wheat still to be harvested, or 71% of the wheat harvested, so still 30% to go, but a large majority of that will be in the western side of the province. And barley, we're fairly fairly close on oats. Again, probably again the majority in the western side of the province. Canola is probably the biggest one that uh, we've uh, we've seen uh, very few acres harvested on this side of the province and the western side so far, and soybeans and the rest uh, just seem to be falling behind, and that's mainly due to our growing degree days and uh, and not just the crop having the right amount of time to to mature and ripen in. So let's talk a little bit about cereals. Uh, wheat harvest throughout the province, uh, you know, you got the central eastern interlake areas, uh, they're pretty much complete. Uh, then when you get to the southwest and northwest uh, areas here, uh, we're probably in that 35 to 40% complete. Um, the numbers will be uh, higher as you move uh, southern to the southern part of the area. Uh, some producers, when you get south of number one highway, are probably in that 70% complete, their cereal crops. Uh, but uh, when you average it all out, we're probably in that 40. And uh, and mainly the biggest issue over the last uh, week to 10 days has been the rain that we've uh, received. Uh, it's uh, definitely caused uh, 
you know, uh, a standstill in the harvest, but it's also started to cause a few things uh, in, uh, in quality wise. Uh, I know I was at a couple elevators yesterday and, uh, and then talking to some producers and definitely seeing uh, some issues regarding uh, mildew and sprout showing up both in swath and standing crops. Um, you know, uh, by far, the uh, swath crop is definitely showing more uh, more issues and uh, and which makes sense when uh, you know closer to the the soil surface you got a compact area with the swath in it and it just stays wetter for a longer period of time the rainfall we got last night is uh, only going to be more of a factor because it was like a, a misty rain and it stayed foggy this morning for a long period that's going to again affect the uh, the quality of the seed and uh, I got another slide here of, uh, of mildew on, on, the, on the kernels and uh, as we continue to get those uh, types of evenings and, uh, and actually even uh, the rainfall we got last night compared to the dew and the uh, heavy moisture from two nights ago, it was almost like a rainfall and you could see where uh, mildew on the seed starts to build up and definitely affect the quality. Uh, they're telling me at the elevators that they're looking for the brush point of the kernel and you can see the blackening as it goes back as the mildew uh, actually starts to uh, uh, affect more and more of the seed and uh, as it gets worse uh, you'll see uh, the grayishness uh, across the entire kernel. So not only is there the bleaching of the kernel and the odd sprout and the sprout will come from uh, this end of the kernel right here where you'll see a breakage or a swelling of that point. Uh, you know, we're seeing uh, uh, just uh, general uh, general uh, bleaching as well. So uh, downgrading is being a factor. I don't think it has gotten to be too severe yet. Most producers I've been talking to over the past week are still looking at a two for a lot of their wheat, which is still pretty good. Uh, you know, I think a lot of producers uh, when they started harvest were, were kind of in that thinking that two range anyway. So uh, uh, I think that's good. Uh, Yield-wise, uh, yield is still holding on. We're uh, still in that probably that 60 bushel average range, and uh, protein levels uh, really varying by variety this year. And I think uh, as you get talking to producers, some of the varieties that are uh, showing some of the higher yields, uh, some of the protein levels have uh, have dropped off a bit this year. And even to the point where we're starting to see a little bit of pie ball in some of those uh, higher yielding fields. Uh, so uh, uh, protein levels a little bit lower there, but uh, yield will hopefully make up the difference. Uh, seeing protein levels anywhere between 11 to 13.5, and I've heard of some 14s. So uh, so definitely got some uh, some protein levels for some uh, some varieties. Here's just one field of uh, votes I was in that was swath, and uh, you could see that it had been, uh, it's actually an unfair picture where the, the swather had turned on the swath and pushed the seed to the words are the, the panicles towards the ground. So they were able to access lots of moisture this way and got off to a, a fairly good start in sprouting. So, uh, you know, this is something where uh, uh, we, uh, we're seeing more and more of, I guess, in, uh, in swath crops. Um, this was uh, another uh, a barley crop, uh, not too far away from this uh, this field as well, and uh, just showing some sprouts on the barley. Now, again, finding pictures that are showing the most severe uh, cases. A lot of them will be more where you'll be where I showed the wheat, where you'll see just the breaking of uh, of the uh, of the of the kernel uh, right now and. Uh, Nothing, uh, nothing where uh, uh, this severe where you got uh, half to inch long sprouts already. Canola, uh, well, canola harvest and uh, again in the southwest uh, and the northwest has uh, has begun, and probably the majority I've seen done is over the last couple of days. Uh, and uh, mainly because uh, the ups and downs of the uh, of the uh, the wheat uh, uh, drying has uh, caused producers to have a lot of their bins full of, of wet grain and uh, canola was actually uh, dry so a lot of producers were um, 
where uh, we're harvesting canola. Uh, quality and yield right now look to be, uh, I would say, right around average. Uh, I'm hearing, uh, you know, lows of 35, highs of 55 range sort of thing. So, you know, in that 40 to 50 range is probably where we're going to land out in a lot of the fields. Um, seeing more swathing than was expected. Uh, and I think from talking to producers, it's uh, mostly due to the wet conditions. Uh, hate to say it, but when uh, you can't combine and you're ready to combine and there's uh, not a lot to do, uh, guys start to think of ways to uh, to speed up harvest. And I think that's one of the things that uh, they were looking at doing is uh, seems when uh, uh, conditions in the evening start to toughen up, a lot of producers will look at uh, uh, straight cutting wheat during the day and and then dropping headers and and, and combining canola at night and, and you know when it's in the swath a lot of times it's a lot easier going through machines than uh, than it is uh, than it is when it's standing so uh, so uh, some strategies to get the, the the harvest done as quick as they can you know across the province uh, the central the eastern interlake areas uh, have uh, a lot more acres complete. Uh, some of those areas, and like Dane had, I talked to Dane before the presentation today, and I think, you know, in the, in his areas, uh, they're they're finishing up uh, a lot of the canola, and uh, we're probably in that, you know, that 20 to to 25 percent complete. It's amazing how fast uh, those percentages can increase, and you get uh, two or three days of of good harvest weather like we've had the past couple days. Soybeans, uh, soybeans are yellowing off and uh, we're starting to see leaf drop in the fields, uh, probably in that R7 to R8 stages. And uh, right now yields look to be average to slightly below average. Uh, you know, we're seeing uh, going out in the fields and seeing a lot of twos and threes in pods. Uh, so not, uh, not, not uh, pods like we've seen a couple of years ago, more like we've seen last year, and I think last year our average yields were in that uh, 31 to 34 bushels an acre, I think was uh, was the average. And uh, so I think we're probably looking at, uh, you know, probably a 30 bushel crop out there anyways. Um, this, uh, the rains that we did receive were, were fairly timing and some of the warm weather we've got over the last couple of days here is, uh, is definitely gonna help fill those late pods. And if we can get that done, we can definitely see uh, see you know an average uh, an average yield to maybe you know uh, the same as we had uh, as as we had last year. Corn, uh, we did experience some frost uh, last uh, I guess it'd be a week about a week ago now, and uh, you can see uh, some of the the corn where uh, we, uh, especially in lower areas, lower uh, areas around sloughs, uh, where uh, the corn seemed to uh, be affected a lot more by the frost, uh, mainly just the top uh, top leaves or leaves that were more exposed. You get into the field and a lot of the leaves are still green. The cobs seem to not have been affected at all. And uh, so I was getting a few questions at the beginning of the week regarding what we should be doing for silage especially uh, when you drive by and start seeing some of the, the leaves uh, turning brown like this. And uh, I guess one of the cautions I was telling producers is that uh, you have to remember there's a lot of moisture in that stock and cob. And if it's still growing, I would, uh, you know, a lot of cases uh, I'm seeing that the corn is not quite ready for, it's just gonna start the denting stages in a lot of fields and uh, uh, it's not quite ready yet for, for putting into the, a pile for silage. You got to remember the more grain you can get in that pile, the better your feed quality is going to be. So uh, um, I'm telling most guys to hold off right now. I haven't seen a field that I thought needed to be chopped at yet. Uh, I think uh, we're going to probably see that starting soon. Uh, you know, next couple of weeks here, I could see uh, some of the corn starting to be put in piles. Um, when you look at the grain corn, uh, we're going to need uh, a good two more weeks here uh, of good weather for it to uh, mature in and uh, get us to the stage where uh, a frost won't be uh, a danger. And, um, you know, basically what we're, we're needing is, 
you know, days where we can get good heat units so we can get to that physiological maturity. I put this up just to kind of uh, show the different stages. And uh, right now I mentioned we are, you know, kind of just in this stage here. So five to six weeks after sil silking. And, uh, you know, we're probably looking at another, you know, two weeks to be into physical maturity. And when you're looking at uh, silage wise uh, and you're looking at the milk line, that's where a lot of people will look to for uh, when uh, silage is ready to go. And when you're looking at about half milk line is usually what uh, producers are looking for to put up silage. And at that point you're at that 40 to 50% uh, moisture. Now it could be uh, probably anywhere in between the uh, the, the half and the quarter milk line where you could put up good silage. And then grain corn, you're looking for this black layer to uh, occur and uh, that's when there's no milk line left and that's when you're in that 28 to 30 percent moisture and basically the seed is matured, you're just needing it to dry down. So at that point, uh, harvest and grain drying could occur but uh, you know, the longer it could stay out there and dry naturally, the cheaper it'll be to uh, to store that grain. And I seen this the the other day, uh, just on some production estimates from Stats Canada. And even though uh, it's been a a bit of a trying year, they do have our numbers uh, uh, higher than uh, than our uh, than what we were. Uh, I guess uh, expecting uh, for the pre from previous years, uh, basically we're looking at uh, you know uh, uh, most of the wheats uh, wheat production going up. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is our canola production has come down a little bit, and uh, that's going to hopefully bode well for the markets. I know right now there's definitely some spot prices as some of the the larger uh, facilities, uh, crushing plants are looking for canola. And if so, if you have canola that you're looking at marketing, uh, definitely get a hold of some of the crushing plants because I think there's a premium out there right now because they want to want to keep up operations. Looking at our barley acres, they've gone up uh, substantially. Our barley our production estimates have gone up substantially over uh, our average and when you look at our oats as well. So which makes sense because you do see a lot more barley and oats being uh, planted and uh, maybe it's got a bit to do with what Dana's been talking about is getting better rotations or more crops and rotations and more producers are looking at some of these crops. Also, there's been some premium, good premiums paid on some of these crops that producers were able to take advantage of uh, last, uh, last fall or through the winter for growing for this season. I guess with that, uh, the seasonal crop reports will be are still continuing on, and uh, um, you know we are getting to uh, to the end of a lot of them because uh, the growing season is slowly coming to an end. But uh, as uh, we're still harvesting these, uh, everything here will still be updated, and uh, and a lot of information on our on our website. So if you're always looking for stuff or looking for new information, definitely go there. Um, the hay listing, I think, is still very important. There's still a lot of areas that are still looking for hay and straw. I think if you have hay and straw for sale, definitely go to the hay listing area. And uh, producers, if you're looking at managing low forage supplies, there's a really good calculator on uh, on how to manage your feed. Regarding the uh, extension specialists for the province. Uh, again, uh, this is the, the people that you can contact in your area if you have any questions. And as always, if they don't know the answer, I'm sure they could find somebody or know somebody, or one of the specialists that can help us out figure out what's going on. And uh, all the webinars, like Lori mentioned, are put on a recording and they're gonna be made available for you. And join us next week, September the 25th for the next edition of Crop Talk. Thanks for attending.